Hi folks, welcome to chapter 14, uh, Coasts Part 1. Um, just a couple things I do want to mention here. Um, in this uh, video, or in this uh, lecture, there's a bunch of, of video clips. I'm not going to play all those video clips. I'm going to leave that up to you. Uh, those are easily accessed uh, through the PDFs uh, on Blackboard under lecture slides or you can click on them on top back. I think the PDFs are actually easier to use personally. Um, you still, however, will be responsible for the materials in those videos. So as you're watching these lectures, uh, pay attention to, to make sure you know which ones are most important uh, to watch. Right. Again, chapter 14, this part of chapter 14 is about coasts and coastal hazards. Uh, in this recent edition of the book, they lumped coasts and glaciers together. I'm going to treat those kind of separately. Um, but uh, this part, we're talking about coastlines. And here's a couple different shoreline characteristics, right? So here's you know, like our, our uh, uh, Pacific Coast over by California, then down here looks more like our Atlantic seaboard. And these represent two different types of, of shorelines. This one here would be a leading edge shoreline, a tectonically active shoreline. And as we know, the plate boundary is right there along the edge of California. And this leads to, you know, uh, uh, an active, uh, um, uh, very rugged coastline. Uh, however, on the other end of our country, we have a passive shoreline. So here, there's no tectonics actively happening right at the uh, at the, uh, the the coast here. The active tectonics, of course, are in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean at the Mid-Ocean Ridge. This coastline is just kind of passively uh, riding along. And as it's passively riding along, lots of sediment are eating shit off the continents, the rivers and streams um, being deposited into the oceans. And these, these rugged coastlines are eventually worn down. We tend to, to, to form more linear, you know, nice shallow be or, or a shallow sloped, nice big continental shelf from all that sediment coming off of it. All right, whereas here we have a much more rugged rise out of the ocean directly onto into mountainous region. Right. Now, one thing to note as we go through this chapter is that, uh, and in the book especially, they focus on oceans. Uh, however, it's important to note that a lot of the things we'll be talking about in this chapter uh, apply to our Great Lakes as well. Our Great Lakes are large enough that a lot of these features that normally apply only to oceans also apply to our lakes. Uh, one of these is tides and the periodic rise and fall of sea level. We all know that's what the tide is, right? Um, do tides happen in the Great Lakes? Yes, they do. But because we have such a low volume of water, uh, they're, they're very small, usually only a, a centimeter or two, and often overprinted pretty readily by things like wind and barometric pressure. So you won't really notice tides here in the Great Lakes, but yes, we do, we do have tides. And these are due to the gravitational pull of the moon, but also the sun. I know we always think of the moon affecting tides, but the sun does as well. Although, even though it's a much larger body, much larger mass, it's much farther away, so its effect is not as large as the moon. Uh, in most places we have two high and low tides each day, about 12 hours apart or so. A uh, couple definitions, tidal range, this is the difference in, in sea level between low tide and high tide, so that difference in sea level is known as the tidal range, and we can get a couple different types of, of, of tides. Uh, spring tides, these are going to be our maximum tidal ranges, right? And here we have uh, the sun and the moon pulling in the same plane, either on the same direction or in, in opposite directions, but they're both pulling in the same plane. In other words, their effects are added to each other. So this is the spring tide, the maximum tidal range, the largest tides that you'll have. Right Now, the biggest of the spring tides is known as a king tide, and I think we've heard of that in the last couple years associated with, uh, uh, with storms and hurricanes uh, hitting at the same time that king tides do, and that's just the largest of the spring tides. Now, a neap tide is the opposite. It is the smallest of the, uh, the tidal ranges. So in that case, we have the sun pulling in one plane and the moon pulling in the other plane. So instead of adding their effect to each other like they do in a spring tide, this, the, they subtract one from the other. And that gives us our smallest of our tidal ranges, known as a neap tide. Right. 
a couple different features that we'll see and we'll talk about and one of the things we'll, we'll discuss quite a bit is the difference between currents and waves and yes we have both currents and waves in the Great Lakes so ocean currents or or any current really is the the physical movement of water molecules objects right so a stream a river these are considered uh, uh, currents right uh, we also have ocean currents and lake currents uh, in our Great Lakes as well um, and one of them is, is it related to tidal currents uh, this is due to the rise and fall of tides and as we get a, a flood current or a rush in right so this would be during during high tide as you see as the, the sea level goes up the salt water floods inland and pushes upstream in river systems and then when you get the ebb right that tide that tidal current then as the, the the water gets pulled out basically sucks that fresher water in uh farther out into the uh into the uh the ocean itself so flood tides and ebb tides these are these are due to, to tidal currents we don't really have these tidal currents so much in the great lakes but we do have other types of currents uh that exist in our great lakes we do have surface currents in the Great Lakes and in our oceans and surface currents uh, these are due to winds as well as the consistent rotation uh, of our earth so uh, when we have you know water and so any anything basically that is in loose contact uh, with the surface so water air airplanes those kinds of things right are subject uh, to what is known as the Coriolis effect and the Coriolis effect is a deflection, and as you notice, these, these currents in the northern hemisphere spin clockwise, and the currents in the southern hemisphere spin counterclockwise, and that's due to the Coriolis effect. And really what the Coriolis effect is all about is uh, the difference in speed uh, when you're rotating at the at the equator versus up at the poles right so if you think about it if you're standing up at the North Pole how fast are you moving well literally zero miles an hour you're just kind of turning in a circle right but on the other hand if you're out here at the equator all right now how fast are you moving you're going about a thousand miles an hour so you go from zero to a thousand miles an hour and everywhere in between uh, as as you go from either pole towards the equator and that difference in in uh, in, uh, in speed is what causes this Coriolis deflection which is clockwise in the northern hemisphere and counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere right? these are large-scale currents in our oceans right these these form uh, and 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 circulate water within each ocean basin so here's you know the North Atlantic and the South Atlantic and the North Pacific and even if you look down here here's an East Australian current right that's what uh, Nemo and his his turtle buddies all swam in right in the, in the movie right we all know that one but uh, but these are our, our surface currents and again these are due to the rotations of Earth's winds. Now we do have these in the Great Lakes as well and imagine uh, in like Lake Michigan here again it tends to be kind of clockwise around the lake right because we're in the northern hemisphere. Also in our oceans not in our Great Lakes but in our oceans we would have what are known as density currents. These are due to differences in density in the water. They're also known as as thermohaline uh, circulation the thermo part comes from temperature haline comes from salinity so these are called thermo haline circulation often uh, and uh, these are large-scale currents that form and their primer their pump is up here right in the uh, the North Atlantic right off the coast of Greenland so what happens here lots of sea ice forms or at least used to lots of sea ice forms and as the sea ice forms right so as water comes close to the sea ice right it starts to freeze but now don't we don't freeze up you know a salt icicle right this is the the the, the, the iceberg is not salt right water it the, it is just pure fresh water the salt gets pushed out of the ice and added to the water around it adding that extra uh, salt makes that water denser denser water wants to sink right 
Uh, and also, so that's the saline part. The thermo part is as warm water approaches ice, what happens when you put ice in a glass, right? You get cooler water. So as that water cools down, as it approaches the ice, that cooler water becomes denser and sinks. So both cooler water and saltier water, right? Both of those factors add this add to this this pump and that's where we start to to, to prime this entire uh, uh, flow right so our deep water currents are driven by this thermo haline circulation starting here off the coast of Greenland right again that cooler saltier water sinks and flows south right gets re uh, recharged as it goes past Greenland splits into two uh, currents right and then Due to the pull of the current itself, this warmer water, which is now also, you know, less dense, less salty, gets, you know, flows back, and then eventually that, that all starts to happen over again, right? This uh, this ocean conveyor belt, if you will, or or density currents, thermal haline circulation here, right? Uh, shutting this off has been uh, linked to the biggest mass extinction on our planet, the Permo-Triassic mass extinction, where 96% of all species, land, sea, and air, bit the dust, probably over a few million years, probably for a few different reasons, but one of them was likely the shutting off of this thermal haline circulation. And one of the issues is, the, as we know, uh, we're losing a lot of sea ice, and as we lose this sea ice, right, we lose our primer, our pump for these, this, uh, this deep ocean circulation pattern. So that's maybe not something that we want to do, right? Oh, also, this is a very important video to watch here. It's about 13 or so minutes long, uh, but it does, it goes through both surface currents, explains um, the Coriolis effect really well, and then uh, does density currents as well. So please do watch that, and I will hold you responsible for material in that video. Right? Uh, now, different from currents are ocean waves, right? Now, of course, we have waves in our Great Lakes as well, right? But in waves, water moves more in a circular motion, right? So if you put your rubber ducky in a current, in a stream, it floats away and you cry, right? If you put your rubber ducky, say, out on Lake Michigan, though, it just kind of bobs up and down and makes kind of a little circle, basically, but it's not swept into shore, right? So in, in, in waves, it's not the physical movement of water and molecules like a current is, in, in, in a wave, the water molecules move in a circular motion, but it is energy that is transported forward. It's basically a front of energy that is moving through the water and disturbing that water column. Right? And an important thing to discuss when we talk about a wave is the wave base and the wave length. The wave length is, is the distance between any two consecutive peaks or troughs of a wave, they'll be the same, right? So the wavelength is the separation between two waves. The bigger the waves, the farther apart they are. Also, the bigger the waves, the deeper they affect the ocean uh, or the water column. So, and this is directly related to the wavelength, right? The depth to which the, uh, the water column is affected is known as the wave base. So as, you know, the wave front moves, or the energy front moves through, the waves start doing their circular motion, that sets off the ones below them, and the ones below them, the ones below them, yada, yada, yada. But eventually you reach a point that the water column is no longer being disturbed, and that is known as the wave base. And its relationship to the wavelength, it is generally about uh, half of a wavelength. So one half of a wavelength equals the depth to which it affects the water column. So obviously the further away the waves apart, right, the bigger the waves are and the deeper they affect the water column. Now something interesting happens as waves start to approach the shore, right? So out in deep water, right, the uh, the wave base is not interacting with the ground. It's it's just you know uh, uh, it's it's not very impeded at all. But as it starts to approach shore, and that wave base starts to interact with the ground, what's that going to do? It's going to cause friction and cause the front of that wave to slow down. Well, the back of the wave keeps coming. That causes the wave to pile up on itself, right? And eventually, it can't take its own weight, and it does what's known as, as breaking, and then it crashes and rushes up the beach in what we know as the swash zone, 
right? So the energy moves through, but as, as we approach shore, right, and those waves start to bunch up on themselves because the front of the wave starts to slow down, the back of the wave keeps coming, it piles up higher and crashes and breaks. A couple of interesting things happen uh, due to this, this uh, slowing of waves, right? And one is wave refraction. And this is the bending of a wave as it reaches the shoreline. So if we imagine uh, underwater here, right here, we have kind of a rugged uh, shoreline. Uh, as these waves approach, they're going to start to interact with the ground. And where are they going to interact first? Well, sticking out by these headlands, right? If we imagine underneath the water here, you know, right outside this headland, it's going to start to interact. Those wave bases start to interact uh, with the seafloor. And it's going to cause this part of the wave to slow down while this part of the wave keeps coming at full speed. And that's going to bend the wave, basically, towards these headlands, right? That's an interesting feature known as wave refraction, right? So again, as parts of the wave hit and start to slow down due to friction, the rest of the wave bends, and it tends to bend things towards, and on, on a very irregular coastline, it bends the wave and focuses wave energy on the projecting areas of these rugged coastlines, which are known as, as headlands. And as it bends them towards these headlands, it dissipates the energy uh, in between them in bays. And as we know, when we dissipate energy, we spread energy out, we drop energy, we cause sedimentation. So here we have a process, again, co-occurring of erosion, right, mainly on the headlands, and deposition in bays. Given time, this will, will tend to erode these back, build these out, and you'll evolve a nice straight coastline like we see on our Atlantic seaboard, right? Wave interference is what happens when two waves interact with each other. So uh, say we have, you know, these waves in here and then another wave kind of comes in. They can have either a positive effect where they add to each other. And this is maybe how we get rogue waves in the ocean, right? Two waves that, that, that their peaks line up just right. It, it makes like a double tall wave. Also, you can, you know, line them up uh, out of sequence, you know, and just have complete interference. Um, and that would, you know, cause two waves to basically cancel each other out. But this, this wave refraction is very important, right? So again, wave energy due to the refraction diverges or, or, or uh, uh, causes uh, energy to diverge in bays and cause sedimentation. Well, it, 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 it converges on headlands and causes erosion there. This also, along a shoreline, causes something known as, as beach drift or longshore drift and the longshore current. And this is when sands, uh, grains, basically move in a zigzag type pattern uh, up and down the beach shore. Uh, and this happens in our, our Great Lakes as well. And you can see pretty good evidence of this when you go to uh, the lake shore. Right? This also causes what's known as a longshore current which flows parallel to the shoreline. And I'll explain this just a little bit more uh, with these two diagrams here. So what we see here is, is as uh, water or as waves approach, right, there's nothing saying that, that the wind has to go completely, you know, exactly perpendicular to shore. And in most cases, it doesn't, right? The wind will come in at a little bit of an angle, and then it'll cause these waves to come in at a little bit of an angle. And as this water swashes up at a bit of an angle, right, up the beach. But then when the water goes back down, right, so it swashes up at a bit of an angle, but it drops back down straight due to gravity, right? Swashes up at an angle, back down due to gravity, up at an angle, down to gravity. As this happens hundreds and thousands and millions of times to billions of sand grains, this bulldozes huge amounts of sand up and down the coastline uh, of both oceans and our Great Lakes. Uh, also produced with this is what's known as the longshore current, and it works in the same direction as longshore drift, and it's due to, again, the bending of these waves. So as this part of the wave uh, 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 hits the shallower portion of the ground first. The wave base starts to interact. This part slows down. This one keeps coming. It tends to bend waves towards the shore and pushes water uh, in that direction. It kind of squishes it out down that direction. So uh, this would be a, a current which is actually physically moving water. So while your rubber ducky might be bobbing up and down due to the waves, as he gets in that longshore current, 
will start to bob up and down and move with the current. Right. Once again, we do have this longshore drift uh, in our Great Lakes as well. Right. So again, this wave energy drives the co-processes uh, of erosion and deposition, right? Bulldozes sand uh, up and down the beach, right? Uh, on those leading edge, those tectonically active shorelines, those rugged coastlines, right? You get the formations of, of those headlands and bays. Uh, but as it becomes uh, an inactive coastline, right? Now tectonics have changed. Our, our say, Pacific Ocean is no longer... Uh, an active coastline, uh, it's going to tend to evolve towards a smooth, straight coastline by, again, uh, erosion of the headlands and deposition within bays, and we get what we see on our Atlantic seaboard. This is another really important video to watch. You know, the video is like half an hour long, and you don't have to watch the whole thing. Uh, just watch from about one minute in to about 14 minutes in when they're talking about waves and coastlines. Uh, and this does uh, a really good job of showing you uh, these processes of, of a wave base and, and um, longshore drift, longshore currents all this good stuff. So uh, please do make sure you watch that and I will hold you responsible for the material in that video. So folks, I think I'm gonna cut this video off right here. We'll pick up next time, uh, starting to talk about hurricanes and other coastal uh, uh, hazards.